All right, we are starting our new unit, and of course that means a brand new do now. So make sure that you are doing a rough sketch, and I mean a rough sketch because this is a very detailed painting called The Last Supper. Um, so what I would do is just do some very general kind of forms or like outlines of where the bodies are and then maybe the, the shape of the table. Um, and then you can get as detailed as you want from there. But remember, this is a rough outline um, and you should be on a brand new do now page. You can pause the video um, so that you can take the time to do this. And when you're ready, we will start our unit. So go ahead and pause the video and then hit play when you're ready to continue on. All right, guys, so we are going to be studying perspective for this unit, and our goal for this unit is I can use one-point perspective techniques to show foreground, middle ground, and background in an artwork, which shows depth to, to create a more realistic artwork. That is a lot of words. Hopefully, some of them will be a review for you. You are going to write down the vocabulary on the next blank page in your visual journal. I would take a moment and pause here and hit play when you are ready to go on. And remember, you want to make one list so that you have room next to each of the words to write down the vocabulary as you work your way through the lesson. We're going to start with what is one point perspective and we're going to watch a short video about the gentleman, Bruno Lesky, that is actually credited with discovering One Point Perspective. According to Hugo Bruno biographer, he stood just inside the main door of the cathedral columns when the conductor blew his perspective with Bernie. Very close to it. Brunelleschi's experiment demonstrated that linear perspective could produce an incredibly realistic illusion of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. So this notion that we can actually develop a system that would be relatively easy to follow, but highly accurate, that could translate the volumetric world that we move through through time onto a frozen two-dimensional surface is really an extraordinary achievement. There is some discussion among scholars as to whether or not there was linear perspective in the ancient world, but if there was, it was lost. And linear perspective was created, at least for us, in the modern world by Brunelleschi in the 15th century, around 1420. Right, and so some people say that Brunelleschi rediscovered linear perspective in case the ancient Greeks and Romans had had it before him. Brunelleschi had gone to Rome and had studied antiquity, and some have hypothesized that he developed the basis for linear perspective in an attempt to be able to accurately portray the buildings that he was looking at, that he was sketching, that he was drawing. It's certainly something that artists, beginning really in the 1300s, were creating forms. They were creating human figures that were three-dimensional by using modeling and making the figures bulky and monumental. Then you had the challenge of putting those figures within a believable space. Giotto and Duccio had kind of approximated that space and began to create a kind of earthly setting for their figures, but had not achieved perfect illusion of space for their figures to inhabit. As the culture becomes increasingly analytical, mathematical, it's a trade-based culture. This is a culture that in some ways may have demanded of its artists a kind of precision, a kind of mathematical accuracy in its representation. And Brunelleschi delivers that. So what does he do? Brunelleschi creates a perspectively accurate image of the baptistry and its surround. Right. So Brunelleschi develops a system with just a few essential elements. And through these elements is able to construct accurate scientific one-point perspective. They include a vanishing point, which is at the viewer's horizon line, as well as a series of orthogonals or illusionistically receding diagonals. What Brunelleschi then does is he paints or draws an image of the baptistry with linear perspective and puts a small hole in the center of it. He takes that small drawing or painting, puts a handle on it, and holds it in front of his face, but facing away from him. He then takes a mirror and holds it in back of that. Now remember, his painting has a small hole in it, so he can see through it straight to the vanishing point. So he's holding the mirror at arm's length, and the actual painting 
with the hole in it right in front of him for his eye to look through. Right. So you can see the painting's reflection in the mirror. And if he pulls the mirror away, he can see the actual baptistry. And he can bring the mirror back to see the painting, move the mirror away to see the actual baptistry, and see if, in fact, those lines are well-coordinated. And it was a very convincing experiment. What Brunelleschi saw in the reflection of the painting looked exactly like the reality that was in front of him. This would have the most profound effect on the history of Western art. Virtually every painting in the Western tradition after the 15th century is responding to linear perspective, either adopting it or very consciously rejecting it for some reason. And within a couple of decades after Brunelleschi's discovery, Alberti, the brilliant architect and theoretician, writes a book called On Painting, in which he codifies Brunelleschi's discovery and creates a manual for artists of how to use linear perspective and how to make great paintings. All right, so one point perspective is really just a way to create depth in an artwork. And that's what you can write down as your definition, a way to create depth in an artwork. The important parts for creating one point perspective are the horizon line, the vanishing point, and the converging or parallel lines. So for definitions, horizon line, you're going to list that as the line that separates the paper into two halves. It does not need to be two equal halves. So you can see your horizon line here. If you've ever wondered why it's called the horizon where the ocean meets the sky, same reason. It's the line that splits something in half. So the horizon line is just like the horizon you see when you're out at the beach. The vanishing point is where the lines the parallel converging lines appear to disappear. So where all the lines appear to disappear. Vanishing point. And for one point perspective, we have just one vanishing point. When you get into two point or three point perspective, you have vanishing points that are two or three, depending on the name of it. And then converging lines or parallel lines are two lines that run next to each other and they are what go into the vanishing point. We're going to look at this artwork here, and I want you to think about the three different parts we just looked at on that last little um, graphic. And I want you to think for a moment about where the vanishing point, the horizon line, and the parallel lines would be in this artwork. Take a moment and think about that. So the vanishing point would be our butterfly here. And if you look at these boxes, the edges of them are going to line up. Those are your parallel lines. And the converging or parallel lines, that doesn't just mean one line. That's several lines can be coming from there. And for this one, our horizon line is going to fall here. Oh, I'm sorry. It's going to actually fall up here doesn't have to be an actual line drawn on the artwork like here. It can run through. Your vanishing point is going to be on your horizon line. You're going to do the same things with these artworks. I want you to try to identify where the vanishing point is, the horizon line, and the converging lines. See if you can identify those. Take a couple minutes here. You could pause the video if you want to look at it and try to figure it out on your own, and then we'll go over it. All right, on this one, your vanishing point is up there by the window. The converging lines, again, don't have to be actual lines. The bed falls nicely along that converging line. And your horizon line is always going to be where that vanishing point is. So if you can find objects in the room, they're going to be kind of heading toward, just like these pictures, how he arranged them here. This is a Van Gogh artwork. Um, they're, they're turned to follow these converging lines. Make sure that all of the things in the room or the items in the painting are 
at the correct angle so that it looks correct. This is called the School of Athens. And again, you're trying to identify where the vanishing point, the converging lines, and the horizon line are in this artwork. And you can pause it if you would like, otherwise I'm going to go ahead and move on and show you where they are so you have an idea. So in the center there where the two main figures are, you're going to see the vanishing point. The horizon line is always where the vanishing point is. Vanish vanishing point has to be on the horizon line. And then you can see the converging lines heading towards that vanishing point. All right, here's our next one. This one's kind of creepy looking. Um, go ahead and try to pick out the vanishing horizon and converging lines again. And then I will show you. So the horizon line is kind of where those trees in the background are cutting the sky there. The vanishing point is right down the middle of the road there. And of course the horizon line is where the vanishing point is. This one's kind of an easier one because the converging lines are, are more obvious. So on this one, if you really follow these lines, these converging lines, you're going to come to the vanishing point. Okay, so just following the end of it, all of these lines are coming down to the vanishing point. And you can see that here. So your vanishing point falls right on that guy's face. And then the converging lines are really obvious in this one in comparison to some of the other ones that we've looked at. So what is the purpose of, of learning about one-point perspective? Why is one-point perspective important? I want you to think about that for a second. Why is it important to know how to create something in one-point perspective? Once you think about that, you can write it down in your journal if you'd like. And the answer that I would say, and obviously there's going to be more than one answer, but the reason that I think it's important that we learn about one-point perspective is so we understand how to give dimension and depth to our artwork. How we can make it feel like some things are further away, some things are closer to us, so that we correctly angle things in our artworks. Depth, you should be writing down the vocabulary for this, it creates the feeling that some things are further away than others. So it gives a 2D artwork a more 3D appearance. It's not so flat. And there's some things that are important, not only the parts of one point perspective, but foreground, middle ground, and background are also important in creating depth in an image. Background is going to be the area in the artwork that is farthest away from the viewer. So your viewer would be up here. Foreground is going to be up towards the front, as close to the front of the, of the artwork as you can get. And then the middle ground is between those two. We're going to look at a few artworks, and I want you to try to think about where the background, middle ground, and foreground would be in the artworks. So again, you're looking for the background, middle ground, and foreground. On this one, your background would be back here. The middle ground would be where the bed is in this front chair. And then the foreground would be this area of the flooring that's closest to you. In this one, you're looking at middle ground, foreground, and background. For this one, your background is going to be this area of the sky all the way back there, and you can include some of those background trees. <coughs> Excuse me. The middle ground is going to be this area here, where the trees are coming up closer, the trees that are back right here. And then your foreground is going to be this kind of creepy gentleman here, and the front trees and the ground up as close to you as you can get.
All right, the last one, and you're looking at foreground, middle ground, and background again. So your background here is going to be the buildings that are far away from you here. Your middle ground might be your bridge here and the people here, and probably these, this section here. And then your foreground is up here where this dog and this gentleman are. So by allowing yourself to put in a foreground, middle ground, and background, you're creating what feels like depth. This is a 2D painting. It is flat, but it doesn't feel flat because of the use of middle ground, foreground, and background, as well as one point perspective. Now this one we already talked about, but I just want to make sure we have this in our vocabulary, and that is overlapping, because we are going to be doing that in our artwork. Um, so just as a review, write down overlapping is when one thing appears to be in front of another overlapping, when something appears to be in front of another. Again, our goal for this project is I can use one-point perspective techniques to show foreground, middle ground, and background in an artwork, which shows depth to create a more realistic artwork. What you're going to be doing today is you are going to be practicing creating shapes in one-point perspective. On your module for the day, you will have a link to the worksheet that you need to print out. If you do not have the ability to print, you can just open up the worksheet and work from it on a blank sheet in your visual journal. You will definitely need a ruler to work through this, and you will follow step by step how to create these shapes. Once you finish your assignment for today, which is practicing the shapes, you can upload it and it also needs to be glued into your notebook or if you're working directly in your notebook, obviously you don't need to glue the worksheet in. Um, and then I want you to upload it to my learning so that I can check out how you're doing. If you don't get finished with it today, you are welcome to upload your worksheet tomorrow so that I can see. And that is it. So that's what you're going to work on in class for today.